today's drama, A Gift of Murder. <laughs> on the heavy door of Gerald Covington's country estate. Miss Eva. Surprised to see me, Baxter? Delighted to see you, miss, and I know your brother will be overjoyed. Come in, come in. Mr. Gerald was saying only last week that he hoped you'd get back from Europe in time for the party tonight. Party? Did you say party? Yes, miss. A party here? A little gathering in keeping with this glad season. As I remember Gerald, he considers all seasons equally glum. I, uh... No, miss, but this, you see, is in honor of your Aunt Frances. In honor of Aunt Frances? Do you mean to tell me that Gerald is giving a party for Aunt Frances? Indeed, miss. Why, Aunt... Where is he? In the drawing room, trimming the Christmas tree. Trimming the... This I've got to see. Gerald! Eva! What a happy surprise, I can't tell you. A Christmas tree? Yes, I did it all myself. And presents? For your Aunt Frances. It is so strange, Eva, that I should want our aunt to have a lovely tree. Yes. My dear Aunt Frances is 72 years old. We may not have her with us long. Darling, last year she was 71, which isn't precisely adolescent. And all she got for Christmas was a dozen handkerchiefs and a cold in the head. Well, this year, things are somewhat different. So I noticed. Last time I was in touch with this little family circle, you and Clyde hated Aunt Frances like death and taxes. You may speak for our brother Clyde, but as for me, I've always adored the dear old soul. Really? Really. Uh, shall I show you what I have for her? Do. So, an antique music box, the sort of thing she loves, and in solid gold. Isn't it charming? Listen. God rest ye merry gentlemen. Expensive item, I'd say. I paid $500 for it, but nothing's too good for dear old Aunt Frances. It isn't possible, is it, that Aunt Frances has come into money? Well, uh, that is... She has. Well, the truth is, an old admirer of hers, Mr. Onslow Fraser, remembered her in his will. How distinctly did he remember her, Gerald? Quite distinctly, Eva. She's inheriting a million dollars. Oh. And when did you hear of this? Only yesterday. A Mr. Elcott, attorney, member of the firm of Elcott, Elcott and Duveen in Boston, brought us the news. Now I see it all. The tree, the presents, the party... You're competing with Clyde for Aunt Frances' affection. I am only trying to brighten the end of her life. You are only trying to become the chief beneficiary of her will. Nonsense. I'm quite sure I will be a beneficiary, as you will, Eva, though I doubt that Clyde will benefit very much, if at all. Why not? I'll tell you why not. It's amusing, really. Quite amusing. Day before yesterday, before Mr. Elcott appeared, of course, Clyde was unfortunate enough to have written me a certain letter. Letter? A letter, my dear, suggesting that we put Aunt Frances in an old woman's home. No. Yes. <laughs> I have the fatal bit of correspondence, keeping it carefully. And when Aunt Frances lays eyes on it, I shouldn't be surprised if she cuts Clyde out altogether. And you're going to let her lay eyes on it, of course. What do you think? Does Clyde know you do? Oh, my, yes. Hmm. <laughs> He's been on the phone for the past two days, begging and threatening my life by turn. Clyde is not a man to let himself be pushed too far, Gerald. I'll risk his wrath. I must go upstairs and wrap the music box for Aunt Frances. If the guests arrive, you'll greet them for me, won't you? Who's coming? Uh, principally the family. Clyde and our dear aunt. And possibly the lawyer, Mr. Elcott. Anyone else? Just that young couple Aunt Frances is so fond of. Mr. Cranston and Margot Lane. Yes, yeah, she likes them. And it's my desire to please her, you know. You bet I know. I'll be down in a moment. Oh, let me see. This white piece of paper, I think, will be fitting. And the bright red ribbon for the holiday touch. Who's that? Oh, come in. I'll be finished with this wrapping in a moment. There, now, I think this makes a very charming little gift, don't you? I said, don't you. I said... Uh... Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Night for a holiday party. Perfect. Whirling snowflakes by a special arrangement with the weatherman. Just for Aunt Francis's sake. Of course. What do you say we'll end the scene in the crowning touch of a Christmas carol before we make an entrance? Mm, I'd be glad to try. Very good, my lady. We shall fill the night with music. <laughs> Have a sword. <laughs> me, 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 me. Me, mm. me. God rest ye mm. merry gentlemen. Let nothing you dismay. <laughs> what is that? Sounds as if something has someone very much dismayed. <laughs> The Ring the bell. Baxter. This lady, Mr. Crenshaw. What's the matter? You look as if you've seen a ghost. Not a ghost, sir. A corpse. Mr. Gerald has been murdered. <laughs> you and Miss Eva? No. Yes. What? Mr. Clyde was here, miss. He rang the bell just after Mr. Gerald went upstairs. Where did he go? He pushed me aside and followed Mr. Gerald to his study. Look at this in the ashtray. A cigar. Still warm, too. One of Mr. Clyde's brand. Clyde murdered Gerald. No. He looked angry, but when I tried to stop him, he said he had to see Mr. Gerald on a matter of great urgency. What sort of matter? Something about a letter. A letter? Yes, there was a letter. Gerald told me about it just before he came upstairs. It must have been somewhere in the study, probably the desk. He said he was keeping it to hold over Clyde's head. Yes, here it is. I'm afraid I'm a little baffled. Oh, it's only too simple. In this letter, Clyde suggested putting Aunt Frances in an old woman's home. What? But Aunt Frances just inherited a fortune. This letter was written day before yesterday. It wasn't until the next day that Mr. Elkhart appeared with the news about Onslo Fraser's will. But it's perfectly obvious what happened, isn't it? Mr. Clyde killed Mr. Gerald to get the letter back. But if he did, why didn't he take the letter with him? It's probably because you two came running too quickly. Yes. And not having gotten the letter, don't you think Clyde may still be somewhere in this house, waiting his chance? If he is, I suggest Baxter be very careful. Uh, why, sir? Because you know too much, and he knows you do. You mean you think he, he just killed one man, hasn't he? Listen Someone moving about downstairs. Clyde, what are you going to do, Lamont? Don't worry, darling. Who's down there? Who is it? Answer me or I'll shoot. You wouldn't shoot a defenseless old woman, would you? And so near Christmas, too. And Francis. Thank heaven. Lamont, let's go down before she comes up and sees Jerry. You go ahead, darling. I'll join you in a moment. Hello, Aunt Francis. Margo and Eva. Dear little Eva. When did you get back, child? Just today, Aunt Frances. Surprised to see me? Surprised and happy. But then all the surprises I've gotten lately have been happy ones. Which reminds me, Miss Lane, Miss Covington, this is Miss Elkhart. Of Elkhart, Elkhart, and Eve. How do you do? Charmed, Miss Lane. You're the lawyer who brought the news about Onslow Fraser's will, aren't you? One and the same, Miss Covington. And happy I was to bear such tidings, just at this joyful season. I should say... Speaking of this joyful season, isn't there something in the drawing room that Aunt Frances would see, Eva? There certainly is. What? Now, you're not to ask questions. Just stand where you are. Mm, mercy me. Now then, Margot, open the door. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas, Aunt Frances. For me? All for you. A lovely tree. Indeed, a very lovely tree. It's so beautiful. It's really so beautiful. Now then, my dear. It's... It's been so long since I had a real Christmas. I'm, I've forgotten how wonderful it can be. Yes, one does forget how wonderful things can be. You rang for me, Miss Eva? Yes, Baxter. Merry Christmas, Baxter. The same to you, Aunt Frances. Do I have the eggnog now, Miss Eva? I can't think of a better time. Shouldn't we wait for Gerald? Well, I don't think so, Aunt Frances. And Clyde, where's Clyde? Right here, Aunt Frances. Oh, Clyde! Right. You don't think I'd miss your party, do you? Merry Christmas, Aunt Frances. And may you wear these for many, many happy years to come. For me, Clyde? For you. Oh, pearls. A choker of perfectly matched pearls. Mr. Alcott, look. Exquisite. 
really exquisite. You must have spent a fortune on these, Clyde. And I haven't a thing for you. That doesn't matter, Aunt Frances. Oh, but it does. I'm rich now, you know, and I insist that you tell me exactly what you'd like for Christmas. I'd like you to be well and happy. Oh, that's very sweet. But isn't there something you'd really like to have? I think I can tell you what Clyde would really like to have, Aunt Frances. What's that, Eva? A letter. Miss Eva, just what are you talking about, Eva? A letter, Clyde. A letter that you wrote Joe the day before yesterday. I never wrote Gerald a letter. Oh, no? How peculiar. And I have it right here, signed by you. May I see that? No, you may not. May I see that, Eva? You may not, May Clyde. I see it now, Eva? Oh, Mr. Covington. He's got a gun. No. Hand it over. Come on. Give it to me. Thank you. Clyde, what's the meaning of this? There's no time to explain just now, Aunt Francis. I must go. However, I beg you not to believe any of the poisonous lies these people may tell you about me behind my back. I want you to know that I do wish you the very merriest... Ah, drop that phone! Don't, don't go on me! Drop it! Drop, drop it! it. Ah. Pick up that gun, Baxter. Yes, sir. What do I do now? Take sir. Mr. Clyde up to the study and hold him there until the police arrive. <laughs> That's right. There's been a murder, and we're holding the culprit under guard. Yes, I suggest you get here as fast as you can. Are the police coming, Mr. Creston? Immediately, Mr. Elcott. I'm sorry I had to spoil your Christmas party like this, Aunt Francis. Oh, Lamont, my dear, you had no choice. Aunt Francis. Yes, my dear? We found this upstairs. A little remembrance that Jill bought for you. A music box. And a very lovely one. Listen. Oh, how charming. And look, it's gold. A proper gift for a golden-haired lady. What did you say, Mr. Elkhart? Mr. Johnson! Uh, uh, Mr. Johnson! Come on! That came from the back of the house. Clyde. He's killed Baxter. Come on, Margo. Baxter! 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 I'm all right, Miss Lane. Oh. Though I can't say as much for my prisoner. Clyde. He tried to escape, sir. So I was forced to shoot. Tried to escape? How could he try to escape with you standing over him with a gun? I don't know, sir. But he did. And since the two of us were all alone here, I'm afraid, Mr. Cranston, you will just have to take my word for it. When Margot and Lamont heard the shot from the rear of the Covington mansion... They found Baxter standing over Clyde Covington, a smoking revolver in his hand. A few moments later, in the massive entrance foyer. He killed Clyde deliberately, Lamont. I'm sure Baxter shot him in cold blood. I rather agree with you, Margaret. But why? Possibly because Clyde had an alibi. An alibi Baxter didn't want him to use. You mean... I mean that Clyde may have not come to this house at all early in the evening. Not even to get the letter? He wasn't the only person who might have been interested in getting that letter, Margot. No? No. Baxter could have used it nicely to hold over Clyde's head as long as Aunt Francis lived, bleeding him with a nice thumb in the process. I see what you mean. Then it may have been Baxter who killed Gerald, too. I don't know. It's only a theory. Theories worth a visit from the shadow. <laughs>
Mr. Lord, his back's going to be all right? Yes, the bullet grazed his skull. He's unconscious, but he'll live. Mm. I left him in the library. This case is getting more confusing every minute. Yes, isn't it? Take Mr. Elcott, for instance. I don't understand his position in this little mystery at all. Well, what do you mean? You mean what he said when I gave Aunt Frances the little gold music box? Yes, he... He said a, a proper gift for a golden-haired lady. Exactly. And how does he know Aunt Frances had golden hair? Her hair's been snow white for the past 20 years. It's an interesting question. And very confusing. It's all confusion. Margot. Yes? Whose overcoat is this hanging in the hall tree? Well, I don't know. If it isn't yours, it must be Mr. Elcott's. Elcott? Why? I just saw this sticking out of the pocket. Clyde's letter. Oh, what's it doing in his overcoat? Must have grabbed it in the confusion. You know, it's just possible that our dignified old friend also saw the value in holding it over Clyde's head. Of course. After all, what do we really know about it? Not much. We're going to find out. Um, I want to make a long-distance call to Boston, Massachusetts. To what number, please? Oh, I don't know the number. It's the law firm of Elcott, Elcott, and, uh... Juveen. And Juveen. Yes, sir. I will place the call and ring you back. And make it fast, please. Yes, sir. Then what do you really think? Time has come to stop thinking, Margot. We're on the verge of the kind of discovery that cracks the case wide open. Yes. Look, I want you to go into the drawing room. Elcott will be there. Yes. I'll tell you exactly what I want you to do. When you get in... Aunt Francis? Lying down upstairs. She's had more excitement than she can very well stand. Sit down, Miss Lane. Thank you. Miss Eva and I were just saying that this case is becoming quite perplexing. It is indeed. This attack on Baxter is the most puzzling thing of all. Now that Clyde is dead, who could have done it? I don't know, but there's certainly no doubt that Clyde's guilty of Gerald's murder. Baxter saw him run up to Gerald's study just before Gerald was killed. I'm afraid that's not true, Mr. Elkhart. Baxter admitted he was lying about that just before he was wounded. Is that so? But there's that cigar, the one that Miss Eva saw in the ashtray. Didn't that belong to Clyde? Yes, Mr. Elkhart, it did. It even had his initials on the band. Do you really think Clyde would have been foolish enough to leave a piece of evidence like that behind, Mr. Elkhart? Well, what, what are you suggesting, Miss Lane? I'm suggesting that with Clyde out of the way, the margin of guilt is narrowed down pretty closely, Mr. Elkhart. To me, Miss Lane? Yes. But to I... To you. I've been with Aunt Frances all afternoon. I was with her at the moment when Mr. Gerald was murdered. Can you prove that? Of course I can. Aunt Frances is right upstairs. You have my permission to ask her. Then it wasn't you? Obviously not. And obviously, Miss Lane... You can now draw the logical conclusion. Yes. I'm afraid we can. Before you do, put up your hand. Eva! Put that gun away. I'm sorry, Mr. Elcott. I'm really quite sorry that you two, who aren't members of this greedy little family, had to stumble on the truth. Do you think you'll get away with this? I can try. There's a very slim chance that you'll succeed. For a million dollars, I'll take a very slim chance. The telephone. Sit right where you are. I'll answer it. Hello? Someone there just put in a call to the law firm in Boston, Massachusetts. Yes? We checked very carefully, miss, and there's no such firm listed. What? There is no firm of Elkhart, Elkhart, and Duveen. What's the matter? Who are you, Elkhart? I'm almost sorry for you, Miss Evan. There is no firm of Elkhart, Elkhart, and Duveen. I know. And there's no million dollars. What? But you came here about Onslow Fraser's will. And Onslow Fraser never made a will. In fact, Onslow Frazier isn't even dead. What? Although just at this moment he almost wishes he were. Then you... Yes, I'm Frazier. Oh, I think I begin to see. I fell in love with Anne Frances years ago, when she was as young as you are tonight, Miss Lane. And I never fell out of love with her. Why did you have to pretend to us that she was inheriting a million? Why? Because I knew how dismally you and Clyde and Gerald had treated her. I had no money to help her with myself. And then the idea came to me, I could make it appear that she'd become an heiress. And then depend on your greed and deceit 
to provide her with at least one really Merry Christmas. A very sweet idea, but... But a very dismal failure, I'm afraid. I'm afraid so, too. I'm afraid there'll still have to be two more murders before the party's over. Eva! There may not be a million dollars, but I still have my life to think of. Don't you realize the police are on their way? But they're not here yet, and I have a gun, and the door is open. What was that? Who closed that door? I did, Eva. (laughs) The door is no longer open. Who are you? I am the Shadow. What are you doing here? I've come to accuse Eva Covington of the murder of her brother, Gerald. It's a lie. A lie. You can't prove it. I can prove you contrived a neat little plot to murder Gerald and convince the world that Clyde had murdered him for an incriminating letter. No. You took Baxter in on your plan, promising him a part of the million dollars you hoped to get. That's why Baxter killed Clyde when he realized he could easily alibi his way out of the charge. How do you know all this? The Shadow knows. And I confronted Baxter who was about to get the truth out of him. It was you who shot him to save your own skin. And I still have a skin to save. Either you open that door or I pull this trigger. Don't be a fool. I warned you. Shut up. Stop that gun. Stop it. Stop it. Let me go. Let me go. As you please, Miss Eva. She's going out of the window. Yes, Mr. Elcott. <laughs> Straight into the arms of the police. <laughs> I thought you were the murderer, Mr. Elcott. I picked it up and hidden it so that Aunt Frances wouldn't see it, Miss Lane. Oh, here she comes. Frances. Yes? I want you to know how sorry I am. Sorry? Why? I've made a tragic mistake. The gift of Christmas that I tried to give you turned out to be the gift of murder. Not really, Aunt Phil. But Clyde and Gerald are dead. It was their own greed and ruthlessness that brought about their death. Yeah, besides, the world's better off without either of them. Much better. Nevertheless, I'm sorry. You shouldn't be. You've made me very rich. But the million dollars wasn't real, Francis. Oh, it isn't a million that's made me rich. It's your kindness and remembrance and the love of your heart. That's real, isn't it? Yes. Then, Anzlo. My dear? Must you take that back? Francis. You mean... I'm alone, and so are you. My darling. Well, what do you know? It looks like it'll be a merry Christmas after all. With many more to come. Ha, 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 ha,